of the ag sphere that I've had to deal with. One is scaling up PostGIS raster to handle large-scale streaming data, stream, data sets for the ag world, as well as the application of PG Point Cloud for machine data. Um, I'll go into machine data and all that stuff in a couple slides. Um, basically, in terms of spatial data for the ag sphere, it really boils down to, I would say, four key components. One is your maps. I have no idea. Eh, you see some yellow marks. Um, this is one of the, a bigger grower in Indiana, but as you can see, if you pay attention where the yellow dots are, most growers have lots of fields, and actually most growers are trying to grow bigger. Um, so it's just the volume of data uh, over time. Two is also ingestion of weather data sets, since almost all ag is driven by weather, whether or not you can go out in the field, is it even time to plant, can I go spray my fields, I'm like, when everything comes together and is a contributing factor of every decision they make. Um, where is everything? I'm like, where are my assets? Both in terms of the personnel, as well as that monster combine on that screen. Um, they need to know in real time, usually, where is my guy? Is he even at the right field doing the right thing? And two, is he using the right equipment? And where's that piece of equipment? Um, but then there's the worst case, most voluminous example, which I gave a super simplified example here is the notion of machine data. This is data that a combine or any other farm equipment records every time it goes out in the field, and generally at an extremely high rate. Um, so I'm going to go start with the two big problems I had dealing with ag. Um, one is the question of scaling PostGIS raster and for handling large, large data sets. Um, just quick background, PostGIS raster was added as part of PostGIS 2.0, it requires Google, um, mostly because of the, the warping APIs, as well as the flexible format supports. Um, it offers per band configurable storage, um, as well as various environmental variables that you need to set for security reasons. Um, basically, a raster object is defined by a header, defines the overall, and then a set of bands. Um, headers, basically georeference information, the number of bands, what spatial reference is it in, and then the bands basically is, what type of data is this? I'm like, is it a 8-bit floating point? Well, not 8, but 8-bit eight integer and other such. Um, but more important is the notion of in DB versus out DB is typically when you're dealing with a database, everything is stored within the database. Um, PostGIS raster is a little different. It does both in the sense that, yes, you can take your raster, satellite imagery, whatever, let the database store it for you. Or you can actually say, I'm going to leave it outside the database, and I'm just going to point to wherever I store my data. Um, so it brings its own set of problems as well as benefits. Um, one of the couple of the key rules I put up here is that the post Progress server needs to know where it is. It can't be a relative path. It needs to be the absolute physical path. Um, uh, it also needs, requires the notion of the Postgres process needs to be able to read it. So if your security is wrong, it's not going to do anything. Um, but because the fact that PostGIS raster is built on Google, anything Google supports, PostGIS will ingest, which means you can do all sorts of stuff. You can give it a URL which is a physical path, and say, hey, it's a WMS service. Suck it up. <laughs> um, so the big data sets that I've been dealing with mostly has to do with weather, imagery, and model. Um, weather is historical data sets, so basically dailies from 1950s onward. Current data sets is what's going on right now in the country, um, as well as what's forecasted, so what's happening every hour for the next three days um, for the US and Canada is currently what I work on. Um, imagery, same is true. I'm like, we try to pull in as much Landsat data as we can. We try to pull in as much NAEP data as we can for 2014. Um, and then modeled surfaces in terms of soil surfaces, things like that, basically trying to inform, yeah, your farm is on this, the soil of your field is of this co composition, and therefore we can make informed decisions based upon that. 
Um, of all the th items here on this list, I'm like the common defining element is that all the data is stable. I'm like when I say that, I really mean it's referential. I'm like essentially read only. I'm never going to change it. Nobody that uses it is ever going to change it. Um, they all have large extents, both in terms of space, U.S. and Canada, and time, 1950s, 60s onward to today, plus three days. Um, high turnover, daily, hourly, every 10 minutes for radar data sets. So there's a nonstop data stream for me coming in. So for me, the basic infrastructure design for me is the I go with a straight up generic Postgres box, nothing fancy. I'm like, one thought everyone always asks me, why did I go straight Postgres instead of doing, say, flat file system and then have some sort of server that interacts with all of it and provides it out? The reason for me is because I have an engineering team. <laughs> so I need to provide a unified interface for them. And since they all are already comfortable with an ORM, SQL, here you go, guys. Have fun. Um, so this is the basic fundamental. But the reality is it's self-contained, one point of failure, everything goes straight to heck, and I lose my job. So the reality is that, OK, I update it a little more. OK, now I'm separating out where the actual management of the data is versus where the actual data sits. Um, but even this fails because it's single points of failure. So now let's take it to the next step. We go with a master replica system. So now at least this way, I can handle many, many read requests as I need to. I can throw on as many replicas as I need, except I have the nice nightmare problem of that my disk I.O. on the file server may blow up on me and say no. So that's where I ended up at the final step. I go with a distributed file system, something like ClusterFS or Lucene, something crazy, something fully scalable, redundant, and just works. Um, and in front is basically a whole set of Postgres servers sitting in front of it. And then I can scale with the demand as the demand grows for me. Um, so one key detail in all this is that this is all being done on AWS. So these are the actual notes that I have for my own self whenever I have to deal with it. One is to go hardware virtualized uh, C-type compute nodes. Don't go anywhere else purely because of the placement groups. You want that 10 gigabits as much as you can, because you will suck it up. Um, all servers should be a compute type so that everything can be attached to that 10 gigabit network. And that's the only way. Um, make sure to use provisioned IOPS, I mean EBS volumes, because um, then you're at least able to maintain a minimum level of performance, because anything other than that, and you have no idea what you're getting. Um, Pretty warm. So I, I allocate one terabyte volumes at a time. I have to pre-warm them just because otherwise you actually get incremental dips in the performance. But the pre-warming itself takes hours, if not a day or two. Um, there is one thought. I'm like, I was talking, I think uh, Seth somewhere, he figured out the secret that I try not to tell people is the, yes, Google is backing PostGIS raster. So whatever Google supports, PostGIS supports. Yeah, so one thing is to do like a um, WMS. You can directly hook up to an S3 bucket if you were really wanting to. Or in my book, you would at least consider a fuse mounted S3 bucket. It's going to have latent latency issues due to S3. But you never know. Or you could go with an RDS. You could pay Amazon for an RDS or Heroku or any of those. The biggest question for me is always whether or not they even have this notion of OutDB. Probability says they don't because it's a security risk, theoretically. But I don't think it's enabled. You'd have to talk to them. So with that, let me go on to PG Point Cloud for machine data. Um, this is actually what I've been working most recently on. I think it's the more entertaining stuff right now, because that was my infrastructure section in dealing with scale. Um, so what is machine data? Um, I started with something simple um, in that it comes out of a piece of equipment that goes out in the field all the time. But it's a little more than that. I'm like, you see the nice monitors? Most of these machines are a quarter million to a million dollars a piece, so they come with a lot of gizmos. 
Um, one of those many, many gizmos is a bunch of monitors, which really is data loggers. Um, they're hooked up to a bunch of sensors, GPS units, and everything. So their goal is to c collect as much data as possible. You're really getting what is this machine doing at this moment in time as frequently as possible. Um, you get another simplified example. But what you get is basically a whole series of points. Um, this is a super simplistic example. I forget which, act, which type of work this is, but this is actually tiny. This is non-existent data to me. I'm like, it barely blinks. I'm like, most data is on the order of 100,000 to 600,000 points, um, typically. But I'll go into that. So, but what's more important about it is that not only is it that I said GPS, bunch of sensors. So we have our geometry, x, y coordinates, almost always in WGS84. And then we have an unknown number of parameters attached to it, basic, or attributes attached to it, because each and every single sensor creates a set of attributes of its own. So if you had a, a piece of equipment that's planting operations, the reality is it's not one planting one seed at a time. It's planting a whole row of seeds at a time. So if you had 20 planting planters, it's going to do 20 data points for each of those guys. It's going to do it at 20 points because of the 20 sensors, in addition to your GPS. So the volume of data, we never know the, demand, the number of attributes until I get the data, usually. Um, so for me, the big problem is it is points everywhere. The reason why I say that is sampling rate. Most machine data is collected at 1 hertz, which is about at least once a second. The size of the field. Most grower farmers, at least the ones I work with in the US, are their average field size about 100, 150 acres. Um, speed of the equipment, farm equipment is slow. They take their time. <laughs> they go like three miles an hour, maybe. Um, number of activities. I guess one key thing is what is an activity? Activity is a, an operation that they're doing upon a field. So one field, they would be doing a planting, a tilling, a spraying, something. Um, and the type of activity, depending on what they're doing, they're generating more data. The number of fields the growers I deal with are on the order of 100 to over 400 fields in their operations. So if you take all of this together and look at it over one production cycle, which is a fancy term for one growing season, so so for the US and Canada, it's basically starting right around now till about the end of November until basically the winter shows up and everything gets frozen from the snow. Um, it's a lot of data points. So for me, the first, the real question is how do I house all this stuff? Um, I could do it the good old fashioned way and stick it in a post just point column, <laughs> uh, except that one activity can generate almost a million points. So I'm given, I don't know how many activities I'll have to deal with per year, I think I'll basically break every single possible thing I could if I stick it in one table. So plus there's the other issue is that there's a relationship between the points because it is tracking them as they go across the field. I have the notion of where have they been and where are they going. Um, spatial indexes are on point data, not as useful for me. Um, I could convert it to a surface, a raster. Um, then the obvious question is, what pixel size? I don't know. Because <laughs> no matter which one I choose, it's going to be wrong. Um, how many surfaces per attribute? Which is also driven by what pixel size? Um, it also assumes a grid, assuming that it's an even surface. The reality is growers, when they go out in the field, they're not just doing a straight line, coming over, turning around, doing another nice, clean, straight line. The reality is they're going with the contour. They're doing U-turns. Some of them are doing donuts um, and things like that. So it just doesn't work quite so well. <laughs> so for me, it ended up being tools from a different domain. I had to start branching out and looking what happens. So for me, uh, first choice was tracking, asset tracking. This is like exactly what UPS and large trucking firms do, is where is my truck at this moment in time in the country? I'm like, OK. Or bio, and from biology's perspective is where you're tracking an animal. It's like presence, absence. Hey, did they pass the sensor? Um, the problem for me turned into there's not a lot of attributes per, per point. I'm like, you really don't have this nonstop data stream of sensor data attached. 
the relationship between points are minimal. I'm like, yeah, for asset tracking, you may, but it's not as significant. So then I went to the other end of the pond and looked at LiDAR data, because LiDAR is one sweep of a LiDAR generates X God knows how much points. It depends on how good the sensor is. Um, so it, it turned into point cloud. Every point has some or many attributes. I'm like, the points are all spatially related to one another. I'm like, these were obvious concepts that I saw as I was digging at the problem. So then it turns into what formats do I play with? Do I go with LAS, PCL, PC, PCD, or PG point cloud? Um, LAS, standard format for storing LiDAR data. The unfortunate part was that it had to be one of 10 available point formats. I don't know how many parameters I have for my point. <laughs> And I don't think I can just stick it in. <laughs> um, it does allow the uh, option of having arbitrary parameters through uh, variable length records. But it seems it just all the APIs seem to be it's a secondary process on top of your main process upon the point formats. So then I looked at PCL, PCD, just because I know the analytics teams that I work with, they will consume PCL just because those algorithms have already been written, and we want to consume them. Um, arbitrary parameters, easy consumption by PCL. I hit a problem in that Paul knows it, but outside, I want to be able to store, eventually store my databases outside the database, outside the database, all my point cloud information outside the database at some point. But the problem is I can't yet because I don't know how to hook it up, and I don't have the time. So in the end, it turns into PG Point Cloud. I already have massive, massive farm of, of, of Postgres servers. <laughs> I'm like, OK. So I, I'm able to define arbitrary parameters using schemas, all within Postgres. It can interact with PostGIS. Interactions are all done through SQL. And it's indexable, which makes everything fast. And one thing I didn't add here, my engineering team doesn't need to learn anything new. Um, so quick background on PG Point Cloud. Sorry, Paul, if I bastardize anything. <laughs> it's an extension for PostgreSQL. It is not po part of PostGIS. It's independent. Um, it does have an extension to work with PostGIS, so you can go back and forth. Um, it also has Poodle support, so if you are using LiDAR data sets, you should be able to readily import that data in. Um, general structure is that you define a format which is comprised, it has an entry in the point cloud formats table. Um, pretty simple, I'm like in the sense that you have a unique ID called the PCID, an SRID, what's the spatial projection, and the schema. The schema is an XML document that defines the attributes of a coordinate. Well, the coordinate is embedded within that, the number of dimensions, but I'm like, or attributes, but so for every single element, it's going to be here's the number and this is exactly what it is. Um, and from there, you build up a set of points. Each point is a coordinate, an x, y, and then attribute information. You take a bunch of those, put them all together, and you get a patch. Defining a what, why are you going to put it to a, together in a patch? Generally, most people do it spatially, but there's other ways to do it, um, either by attribute, time, similar values. You can do it any number of ways. Um, and then I hit another problem. Uh, there were no import tools from vector data sets. I couldn't take a shape file or a GeoJSON file and bring it in. And the bigger other problem was that I'm taking these data sets in from a variety of different sources, totally different equipment. Everything is different across the board always. There was no way to transform or normalize all of it to from, one, from whatever schemas they're in to one common schema so that production side, they have no qualms, no problems dealing with it. Um, so I, I basically wrote my own <laughs> on top. because, And that's the URL. If you guys want to play with it, it's there. I plan on fixing it up and making it look prettier, but it's, <laughs> it's there. Um, but the first thing I realized was the importers. I had to write an importer at the very least. So what I wrote are basically two command line utilities that import vector data to PG Point Cloud points and patches. Um, if 
you are like some of my friends and coworkers, you s try to sneak in data that's not points. Um, and for them, I take the centroid. <laughs> um, so the utilities build up the schema and gets consumed. Um, both the utilities do behave the same way. I'm like, it fills up the temporary table with the points and then builds a final set of patches that get put into your output table. So I wrote two, um, OGR to PGPC. So anything OGR supports, this, this product, I'm like, the utility will handle it. And then I wrote a GeoJSON to PGPC because OGR to PGPC does not really work well when you got a hundreds of megabyte GeoJSON file <laughs> and it's taking too long. <laughs> so I basically strip it out and basically say, okay, here's Ge GeoJSON, process it my way. And it's faster. Um, but it, it's, the key for me was that it's flexible because I have no idea what I'm dealing with. I just know their vector data. Um, ah, here's the sample usage. I'm like, I just wanted to give a high, quick, easy example. I'm like, these are all Python. Yeah, they're all Python uh, utilities. So for me, it was the key idea is I was like, I know that my data is going to be dirty. I know it's going to have differences. So I need to be able to control what attributes get processed and ingested, which means I need to be able to ignore it. I know that in GeoJSON, GeoJSON ha well, JSON has no notion of how to represent dates and times and timestamps. But then there's also the other side of the problem is Point Cloud has no notion of time. Everything has to be a number of some sort. So there's the context of, OK, if you get a date time, tell us that it is a date time, and then we'll process it. So it's going to convert it. So in this case, it converts a timestamp attribute to UTC, UTC seconds since epoch, which is nice. Consistent, Postgres has a nice way to convert it back. Um, database connection string, it writes straight into the database. There is no intermediary files. Um, same goes, you just point the input file that you want. Um, maximum number of points per patch, maximum patch size, basically. And similar to SQL, no. SHP to PGSQL, I'm like, there's same notions of, do you want to kill the table before we create it? And behaviors upon the actual objects. Um, the other function I wrote ends up being called PC transform. Um, it kind of like SD transform for geometries or rasters. It's about converting from one schema to a different schema. Schema here being a point cloud schema. Um, if it needs to, it'll transform the coordinates, the x, y values as well. Um, the only limitation is that it requires a mapper. The reason for that is because Let's say, for example, I had two schemas, X, Y, Z, intensity, PCID 1. Actually, this is exactly from the docs for PG Point Cloud. Um, and then I created a new one that also has this new thing called reflectivity. And I could have given it, it sounds nicer than whatever I could have put in. But the idea is that I would call the function PC transform, PA is patch. I'm transforming it to PCID 2. And then there's this JSON string um, structure. And all it's doing is basically saying it's a mapper. Say, so go from, I'm like, everything on the left, on the, yeah. <laughs> left, thanks. Is that everything on the left is basically the destination. So X in, at the destination side, and then on the right hand side is what you're going to do. I'm like, what is the equivalent column, the equivalent attribute? or the position, or if you need to do some post-processing, it's the notion of, so x colon 1, OK. Whatever's in position 1, stick it in x. Whatever, so I'm like, so 2 equals null, same thing. I'm like, well, position 2 goes to position 2. But the more important ones is like reflectivity, where I need to do a computed value. Yes, I put a garbage formula here. But that's the same is the idea is that I need to do some post-processing as I need to. Um, and it works. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really help when you're trying to build a product that automatically does it. So the mapping's not super. It great, works great when it's one time and it's just me doing it. So that's kind of where I get to the next steps. I'm like, I need to be able to. So there's two parts for the raster, parallel processing. Um, it's one thing to be able to house all that data and be able to deliver all that data. It's another thing to operate upon all that data. 
And that's one of the big ones to be worked on soon is the parallel processing notions, especially with the capabilities 9.4, Postgres 9.4, and 9.5. Um, for point cloud is to have a notion of at least a naive auto mapping capabilities um, in PC transform. So enhance that out so that if you don't really care about the mapping, but you want it, you know, trust the auto mapper, OK. Um, I also need a notion of a PC patch. I'm like, there is a PC patch code within the command line utilities. I need to pull that off into the actual database. And then some notion of map algebra for PC points. Kind of similar to with rasters, but I want to do it on points in a point cloud and grab a set from the neighborhood and then act upon it. Um, yay. Um, well, thanks for coming, guys. Um, I think I deviated a little from my talk. <laughs> but that's mostly it. Cool. Thank you. Can you give some examples of some of those sent on board sensors and what kind of data they're collecting? So, okay, so the, the most obvious one I've been dealing with is the notion of when they go out to a product application. Um, so they usually have around 16 sensors for each nozzle that's on the device. Exact fertilizer, tank mix, whatever, I'm like that kind of stuff. And every time, so it's sampling once a second, but the reality is that the sprayers may be going continuously. And so basically it's getting that delta from the last, last data grab it did. And it's doing that every time until they stop or they have to stop. Um, so that's for that. I'm like for harvesting, it's very different. Harvesting is actually a lot more complicated because you're trying to do a lot more. So like for corn and soybeans and such, what they're actually on the fly trying to get an estimated number of bushels that are, have been harvested from this field. You're trying to get an estimated number of the um, quality of the grain as well. So I'm like, how moist is it? The moisture really matters because if you're doing storage, you can't have it too moist, otherwise it's gonna rot. Um, so those are the kinds of quality checks that's being computed on the fly. But what's funny is that when you get to that point, your sensors are actually moving constantly, but there's actually physical, um, so when a combine's collect harvesting, in reality, there's about a six second delay between the value coming off of some of the sensors versus what, when it's getting recorded. So that's the kind of volume that um, ag is dealing with right now. Um, I'm like, there's commercial alpha, well, the major manufacturers, John Deere, um, Caterpillar and such, Kubota, they, they're all getting into the market. The big problem is they're all little islands and they're all proprietary data formats. <laughs> so it's unfortunate. Frank, there's a gentleman right behind you first. Sorry. <laughs> you had your hand raised first. <laughs> We do do raster processing. Um, in terms of agronomic data, like we currently have the business side talking is that we're trying to stay away from the agronomy, agronomist's job because most of the large growers have their own agronomist in house. I'm like they have access to all the custom agronomy software. So we're trying not to do it. I'm like, we're trying to make sure we build up the data sets needed. So if we need to go that way, we can, but not anytime soon. I'm like, for us, the closest we'll do is create surfaces showing, instead of data paths and points and stuff, it's just a surface of how good, how good is your field? I'm like, so for next season, it's kind of, I'm like, that's where the agronomist kicks in really. I'm like, you don't need to put fertilizer on this part of this field. We're trying to stay out of that kind of question for now. Yes, Frank. Uh, you mentioned uh, lots of uh, uh, input products. I guess you've got some sort of family of scripts that converts this all into JSON. Or uh, yes, for the for these ones, yes, we do. We. And my follow-up question is: you talk a little bit more about why the OGR uh, PC was quite a bit slower than the custom JSON. Is it like a streaming thing? I think it was just a. 
at the end of the day, it, well, it, 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 I believe it had to do with the normalization to some degree that OGR is doing. I'm like, in terms of saying it's an OGR integer, OGR that, for every single data type, every data point. And that doesn't mean it was bad. It was just the, for us, it turned into, I can't wait 45 minutes for this one file to be processed. <laughs> so it was kind of more the, OK, let me just go pull in simple JSON and brute force this thing quickly. And it just worked better. I'm like, the reality is for us is that our data streams, in the exporting data streams for us, is that it can come by shapefile or by GeoJSON. So I still need both. Cool. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>